Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Just a little uh, background about how I get interested in uh, executive skills. It was um, through my work particularly with children with attention disorders um, because I, I made the link along with my colleague and my co-author, a guy named Dr. Guerra, or Dick Guerra, I call him, um, made the link between the um, kids with ADHD and executive skills. Uh, and it took me a while to get there uh, because when you look at ADHD, we particularly focus on kids with problems with attention or hyperactivity, impulsivity. Uh, and as I worked with the, began working with those kids more extensively, I, I realized that um, their problems went beyond that. They had problems with planning and time management and organization and those kinds of things. Um, and I remember talking with my colleague uh, Dick about it at the time, and he did a postdoc in neuropsychology at Children's Hospital in Boston. And as he was describing those issues, or as I was describing those issues, he said, well, Peg, those are executive skills. Well, this was the late 80s, early 90s, and that was not a term, <clears throat> excuse me, that was widely used in those days. So he and I decided we really wanted to focus on them. We wanted to understand what they are, how do they develop, what's going on in the brain, um, and more importantly, how do they impact school performance, and how can we help kids with weak executive skills become more successful students. We've been doing that, obviously, for about 30 years now. Uh, and somewhere along the way, we realized it wasn't just kids with learning or retention problems who struggled with executive skills. In fact, these skills are slow to develop in all children, and therefore, in some ways, all children struggle with executive skills. Uh, and so that, to me, is, is probably the most useful concept I've gotten out of this, is that when I think about these skills, I think about them as, as underlying, underlying school achievement for all kids. Um, so when I was asked to present this year, and I, I, I was asked back after last year's presentation, which is always flattering, but when I was asked this year, they, they gave me a, a topic and they wanted me to try to connect um, the exit outcomes that has been developed by your school board with uh, executive skills. And they sent me a very colorful poster, which, or, yeah, which I think you probably have also seen that, that lists the, the six characteristics and six skills that go into their exit outcomes. Um, and so I had enough material to go on that, that I could look at that and, and try to make the link with executive skills. Um, and I will, I, over the next hour, I'll draw that link and I'll talk about how parents can support this whole process, which really, there's such an overlap between your exit outcomes and executive skills that I think by working on one, we're working on the other. Um, so let me start with what executive skills are. Uh, they are brain-based skills. They're managed out of the frontal lobes of the brain, which is the part of the brain right behind the forehead. Um, and they're basically, if we wanted to come down to a single sentence description, they're the skills required to execute tasks. Planning, organization, time management, emotional control, I'll go through all of these step by step. Um, so they're frontal lobe functions that begin to emerge shortly after birth, but take a full 25 years to fully mature. And that's in typically developing kids. Um, with kids with neurodevelopmental or attentional problems, it may take even longer than that. Um, so no child finishes secondary school with a fully functioning set of executive skills, I guess is, is the message to sort of keep in mind, especially if as a parent you're panicking because your kid doesn't have them all yet. Um, so there's not a lot of consensus in the field around executive skills. If you look at, um, in starting with the terminology, I mean, how we describe them, uh, the typical label in the literature is executive functions. Uh, that's what you'll find most commonly, and if you want to know more about this, you should probably Google executive functions. Um, Dick and I chose executive skills as an alternative to that, and we chose it deliberately because we wanted the focus on skills. If you have a skill, it's something no matter what level you're at, you can get better at. Uh, when we think, when I think of functions, I think, you know, it's a use. It's like a photocopy machine. You know, it either works or it doesn't work. It doesn't get better. Um, but skills do get better. And that's the hopeful message we want to give people. <clears throat> Some people combine the two. They call them executive function skills. And I'm happy with that because that at least leaves skills in the, in the title. Um, there's not a lot of consensus about how many there are. Uh, some people maintain there's only one. They call it the central executive. 
Hardcore researchers usually focus on three. Um, but when I look at those three, I find a bunch of other skills embedded in those. And so we've tried to unpack those a bit. Um, at the opposite extreme, there are people who maintain there are 40 skills. Uh, that's more than I can. <laughs> Part of my message is if kids aren't acquiring these skills naturally, then we have to teach them. I can't ask anybody to teach 40 skills. So, so Dick and I took a middle ground. We basically said of all the skills that are out there that are being mentioned in the literature that experts on executive functions are talking about, which ones are the most critical for school success? Uh, and then our, so we centered on 11. We feel like the 11 we've got here pretty much define the universe. If you can focus on these skills, um, your kids can be good students. Um, and I will show you how they map onto your ex exit outcomes so that you can see how, how those two sort of go together. Um, the next question we asked ourselves was, could we come up with definitions for these skills that were crystal clear so that everybody could understand them? Because when you delve into the research, what you can get bogged down very quickly in um, abstract concepts and, and really complicated terminology. We wanted to avoid that. Uh, so I'm going to go through our skills one at a time just to make sure we're all on the same page about them. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over them. Uh, certainly, if people are interested in knowing more about any of this, you know, we've written several books, uh, both for parents and professionals, that will give you a whole lot of additional information. But at least we'll have the introduction, and then we can move on to the exit outcomes, and then I can give you some, some tips for how to help your kids develop these skills. Um, I, I won't go into the development, but I will tell you that the order in which I talk about them are the order in which we think they emerge developmentally. This is somewhat speculative. No one's actually come up with uh, an exact uh, a developmental progression for these skills, although people get frustrated when they ask me what it is, and I say, I can't tell them. <laughs> so what, do you, what should you expect of kids at any given age? And, it's way too contextual for that. Any given situation affects a child's ability to use their executive skills well, so that's the problem with that. But I will say, you know, we think this is the order in which they emerge developmentally. Um, so response inhibition is the first skill to develop. Uh, it's basically the ability to stop and think before you say or do something. Um, the, the expert on, on executive skills that we refer to most commonly is Russ Barkley. He's considered, I consider him anyway, the world's leading expert on ADHD. Um, he maintains this is the most critical skill. If you don't get response inhibition, how are you ever going to get something like planning or time management? So this is a really critical skill. And it starts developing around six or seven months of age in infants. Obviously, it's very rudimentary at that point. Um, but let's go on to uh, the next executive skill, which is working memory. It's the ability to hold information in mind while you're performing a complex task. It also involves the ability to draw on past experience and apply it to the situation at hand, and then make a decision about how you're going to act going forward. So again, this is another critical skill. If I, I often say, if I want to stress this out in a testing situation, I'll give a kid a, uh, orally, I'll present a multi-step math problem and ask them to solve it in their head. So they have to remember all the numbers, they have to remember where they are in solving the problem, they have to remember which procedures, I mean, all of that. But there's really nothing that we ask kids to do that doesn't require working memory. I mean, even sending them to their bedroom to retrieve a sweatshirt, they still have to remember why they're there when they get there. So this is obviously a critical skill. The next skill is emotional control, and it's the ability to manage emotions in order to complete tasks, achieve goals, control and direct behavior. Um, when I do workshops, I very often start with a, a logic problem that I ask people to solve, and it's a really annoying problem, to be honest. <laughs> people get really irritated. <laughs> um, but then I asked them afterwards, so what kind of skills did you need to draw on in order to try to solve this problem? And they give me things like attention, planning, um, working memory. They may not call it that, but they'll say memory. They'll give me all of those. And invariably, they leave out emotional control. I really have to pull it out of them. And I've been using the same problem for like 20 years. And it finally occurred to me, since I have to pull it out of them, what that means is people don't automatically connect managing your emotions with learning. And yet, it's really key, not only managing negative emotions so they don't get in the way of learning, but we know a lot about the impact of positive emotions on learning. It's huge. That's why when you can make learning fun, it, learning is a whole lot easier. 
So that's the third skill. All the ones I've talked about so far emerged during the first year of life. Um, flexibility is the next one. Um, I, this is the ability to go with the flow, to have something unexpected happen and be able to handle it. You know, a change of plans, a change of routine. Um, when a solution to a problem doesn't work out, to be able to say, okay, that didn't work, what else could I try? Um, and all that requires flexibility. Uh, I think of this as, as being the, the skill that sort of underlies creativity. Uh, and so when we get to the exit outcomes, you will see how important that is. Uh, and creativity sort of is a, weaves itself through several of the exit outcomes. Um, sustained attention, the capacity to maintain attention to a situation or task in spite of distractibility, fatigue, or boredom. Um, and that's the key piece that, that often sort of stumps parents. And I'm sure I told this story last year. I have many parents in my office sort of nudged in by a teacher or by a pediatrician because someone thinks their kid has attention problems and they'll say to me, my kid can't have ADD, he can play video games for hours. <laughs> well, video games don't involve distractibility, fatigue, or boredom. So what I tell people is it's not that kids with ADD can't pay attention, it's that they have trouble making themselves pay attention. So that's the piece that's challenging. And where are parents gonna see that? Homework, chores, boring daily routines. That's where the attention problems show up. Um, and sort of the flip side of this, and I'm not sure we probably, I mean, it might make more sense to reverse these, but I, I think sustained attention may come first. A task initiation, which is the ability to begin tasks promptly um, without undue procrastination. Um, again, I don't have time to go into detail, but I will tell you, because I think everybody should know this, from my clinical and personal experience, as well as some of the reading of the research I've been doing, I think this may be the last and hardest skill to acquire, um, which I know is frustrating to parents. I mean, I, parents say to me, doesn't my kid realize if he'd start the long-term project the day the teacher assigned it, rather than the day it was due, it would go so much better? <laughs> Yeah, that's task initiation. And interestingly enough, there's a good, I saw one survey that said 20% 20, 20 of adults consider themselves to be chronic procrastinators. So that's a good chunk of adults. Um, okay, moving on to planning and prioritization. The ability to create a roadmap might be a, a sort of metaphor for that, but basically, and, and although prioritizing is just a piece of planning, we keep it on our title to remind people that it's an important piece. Some kids can't plan because they can't prioritize. Um, I, I'm doing some coaching with a, a, a very accomplished woman. She's, a, she's on the Harvard faculty, she's an MD, uh, and she was actually, she wrote me recently that she was invited to do a presentation in Calgary. Uh, and as she's flying to the presentation, she's working out the last pieces of her presentation. And she realized, I mean, I've, I've been coaching her about getting stuff done promptly, and she realized that she had no trouble focusing during those, that three hours that it took her to get from Boston to Calgary, uh, in part because it just took out all the prioritization issues, went away. She had to do that one thing. And so she didn't have to prioritize between several key important projects. So that's just an example of how the prioritizing piece sort of factors in there. Um, organization is the next executive skill. Uh, the ability, now there's a key word in my definition, and again, if you were here last year, you may remember it. The ability to create and maintain systems to keep track of information or materials. And the key word is maintain. Um, and if any of you have tried to turn a disorganized kid into an organized kid, you know this is a long-term labor-intensive process. Um, you know, it's not just a question of creating a system and handing it off to the kid and expecting them to run with it. This really does take time and effort. Um, and in the, in the last several years, I've run across schools that have really taken this on and decided, you know what, we've got to teach kids to get organized. Uh, rather than seeing it as a waste of time on the part of teachers, where they realize if they can help kids create and maintain systems, um, then that's a lifelong skill that they're going to use long after they finish school. Um, time management is the next one. Uh, now, I'm, I've got three left in our, in our system. Um, and so if you look at these last ones carefully, you'll find earlier developing executive skills embedded in them. Uh, so time management is basically task initiation, sustained attention, and planning. Um, with one additional element that's unique to time management, and that's time estimation. The ability to estimate how long it takes to do something. 
Um, and in my experience, for people, both kids and adults, who struggle with time management, it's the time estimation piece that's often faulty. Um, and so that gets in the way. I believe it can be taught, and if we have time, I'll, I'll, I'll mention strategies for that. But, but that's, I think, where to focus on in terms of time management. Goal-directed persistence also has earlier developing executive skills embedded in it. Um, you know, and I think in its earlier form, that you can see in kids as young as, as preschool, we could call it persistence. And we know there are differences between preschoolers who are persistent and preschoolers who aren't. Um, and we know that modeling persistence on the part of parents uh, or adults really helps kids develop persistence. When, when very young children see parents struggling with something and, and sticking with it and achieving success, that makes a difference. As we're thinking about goal-directed persistence, we're thinking about it in a sort of later, more mature iteration. So our idea of goal-directed persistence is the ability to set a goal, which is not necessarily something you're going to achieve by lunchtime, but a longer-term goal. Uh, and if that's the case, then you can see where other executive skills come into play. So you set that long-term goal. You can't just set it and forget about it. You have to remember it, so there's working memory. You have to have a plan for achieving that goal, so there's planning. You have to start and finish the plan, so there's task initiation and sustained attention. And you have to resist the temptation to engage in all those other more enjoyable things you would rather be doing than working towards your long-term goal. That's response inhibition. And if that's irritating or annoying for you, then you also have to manage your emotions associated with it. So there's, there's emotional control. Um, so this, this is, having said that, this is a very late developing skill. Um, I have uh, frequently, it, 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 to, in the United States, middle school is the grade 6, 7, 8, 12, 13, 14-year-olds. We tend to put them in separate schools. And I think of this as the killer school for middle school parents because they expect kids to have the skill by age 12, 13, and 14, and they don't. At least most of them don't. Um, and so I, with this particular skill, I preach patience. Um, I preach modeling your own goal-directed persistence. I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, and encouraging kids to pursue goals, um, starting with what they want, their goal, rather than yours. OK. And then metacognition which is the ability to step back and see the big picture, uh, to connect the dots, to put the pieces of the puzzle together. It's hard to talk about metacognition without using a metaphor, which is apt because meta is the same in both. But basically, it's, it's the ability to recognize that you have thoughts, and you can use those thoughts to understand the world, to make connections, um, and to solve problems, basically. So I think if I were going to boil metacognition down to one thing, it's the ability to make connections between things and concepts, experiences, personal and otherwise. Um, very late developing skill, um, in part because it's dependent on a brain process called pruning, um, which doesn't kick in until adolescence. And, th and that's a process whereby the brain starts to discard excess neural connections. I mean, Shortly after birth, the brain starts growing synaptic connections. That's how the neurons in the brain communicate, and experience makes those connections. Um, but if that process continued indefinitely, we would have way too many synaptic connections, and we would have to have huge brains. Um, so the brain adjusts by getting rid of excess unused neural connections. And what we know about this, when the brain undergoes pruning, the, the neural connections that remain work way better. They, they can transmit larger volumes of information, they can transmit it more rapidly, and they can connect with more distant regions of the brain much more efficiently. So almost literally, metacognition is about the ability to easily make connections. Um, so those are our 11 executive skills. Um, and now I want to connect it to your exit outcomes. Um, and so it, you can't read this, but I'm sure you have it in front of you. Um, they, your, your school board has identified six characteristics and six skills. I think they might be somewhat arbitrary in terms of the difference between characteristics and skills because I can find skills embedded in characteristics and I can probably find characteristics embedded in the skills. But it doesn't matter because I think in from a values perspective and from an outcomes perspective, if we can get these particular skills into kids, um, they are going to be very effective um, students and lifelong problem solvers, basically. So let's, let me now draw the connection between the two. 
Uh, obviously, the first characteristic is goal-oriented. Um, and that's basically the, the ability to, to work towards a goal. Uh, and obviously, goal-directed persistence is exactly what that is. Um, the next uh, characteristic is being resilient, to be able to handle setbacks, um, to be able to problem solve, to be able to persist. Uh, and so y you can see flexibility, emotional control, and again, goal-directed persistence being critical skills for this. Being globally aware, uh, being aware of uh, the various factors that are affecting um, our, our, our global environment. Um, and I can't read, I was hoping this would be big enough that I can read this. Um, yeah, I can't. <laughs> so, but at any rate, that kind of awareness obviously is metacognition. That's a, that ability to make connections again. Um, the next skill is being collaborative. Uh, so that's being able to work as part of a team or a partnership. Uh, to be able to do that well, uh, first of all, requires flexibility. You can't always argue for your idea and not listen to anybody else's. You have to be able to set aside your ideas and, and consider others. Um, you have to be able to manage your emotions. If you're working in a team, chances are at some point or other you're going to get annoyed or irritated or maybe even anxious by something other team members are doing or saying. So that requires emotional control. It requires response inhibition. Um, rather than blurting out stuff impulsively, uh, giving other people a chance to talk, but also stopping and thinking before you say something that might hurt another person's feelings or figuring out a way to say what you believe without hurting another person's feelings. And then again, metacognition, because part of metacognition is the ability to read social cues uh, and the ability to um, read facial expressions, tone of voice, to understand where people are coming from, um, and to take that into account as you're trying to decide what role you're gonna play in that group. Uh, and then it, being innovative and creative. And again, flexibility, I already mentioned flexibility as being a key part of that. But also metacognition because innovative is the ability to make novel connections. Um, and again, that's how I think of metacognition. So those are the characteristics. Let's go on to the skills. Um, being critical thinkers this is pretty much an overlap with innovative and, and uh, creative. Uh, being able to think critically, uh, again, flexibility is what is the skill that allows you to consider two concepts or two ideas at the same time. Um, metacognition is the, is the ability to, to evaluate those concepts or ideas and make good decisions to understand, to do both, um, you know, to do critical thinking um, and to analyze uh, and make sense out of information. Uh, being academically diverse. As I read that particular uh, skill, to me that looked like, you know, if we go back 60 years or 50 years when I was in elementary and, and, uh, and high school, um, my guess is the curriculum my school was using probably could have, all we had to do was talk about academically diverse. Because <laughs> it's basically, as I read it, it's talking about the traditional kinds of subjects, being able to do math, science, English, um, to have a set of skills, so a knowledge base um, that you can draw on um, for a lot of these other skills. Um, and so that's why I included the executive skills that I think underlie sort of traditional learning, working memory, task initiation, sustained attention, planning and prioritization, and time management. I mean, those were probably the skills that got me through school. I may have had to do a little metacognition, not much flexibility. So it's important this is in here because even though we want kids to be great thinkers, we still want them to have a knowledge base that they can use to think. Um, but it's, it, it's now, in this day and age, a much uh, less, it's a much smaller piece of what we're hoping kids will get out of school. Uh, being digitally fluent. So, and obviously this wasn't around when I was a kid. Um, it's being able to use technology well and responsibly. Uh, so being able to use it well is the planning and organization piece. Being able to use it responsibly is the response inhibition piece. Um, I hear from so many teachers who say, well, we've gone to having kids use tablets or Chromebooks or iPads or whatever in the classroom. Um, and 
what we find is that they're doing all kinds of other things on their on those digital digital devices other than paying attention to the lesson. Uh, and so a lot of schools, once they introduce that kind of technology, that's the first year. The second year, they collect all that technology back and they start pulling stuff off. <laughs> Say, no, you're not gonna have access to Facebook. You're not gonna have access to social media. Uh, so they, lim they begin to limit how kids are using it. Um, so if a school is in the early stages of, of, of doing this digitally fluent uh, skill, I would recommend spending probably a year thinking about how you're going to incorporate this into your school. Um, before you hand kids any uh, device. Um, another skill being effective communicators. Uh, so again, response inhibition, which means you, you're stopping before you're saying something. Sustained attention, which means you're listening to the other person all the way through. Um, and again, kids with attention disorders have problems with both of these. Uh, and so, as soon as an idea pops into their head, they're blurting it out. Um, but they're also not, sti if someone has a lengthy explanation, they have trouble sticking with it until they fully understand the explanation. So those two are particularly important. And obviously, the metacognition again, that ability to take and connect ideas and thoughts, your own thoughts as well as everything that, that people are sharing with you. Um, and then finally, being ethical decision makers. Uh, so the response inhibition comes in again uh, in that we, we stop and think before we do something that's unethical. We stop and think about what we're posting on Instagram or um, how we're using Twitter or whatever. But metacognition as well because in or if you think about it, making ethical decisions is pretty complex um, because there are very few rules that are so black and white that they work under every circumstance. So you have to be able to sort it out and decide, okay, I've got two values here. They sort of compete with each other. Um, which, one, which one should I go with today in terms of being the ethical decision to make? Um, so those are the connections. Uh, every single one of my 11 skills are somewhere, and some of them are more than once, one, uh, are listed more than once, and in fact, as I look at them, the ones that come up uh, more than any other are probably flexibility and metacognition um, and response inhibition, which is interesting. Uh, so now, let me, let me just uh, drill down a bit on executive skills and then start giving you uh, suggestions for how we can manage them, um, or support them, I should say. I've begun to think about two levels of executive skills, foundational and advanced. Uh, again, just using um, our framework, because ours is not the only framework, it's just the, it's the one obviously I'm most familiar with, but it's also the one that I found people really, teachers in particular really respond to, parents respond to it. So the foundational executive skills are the first six. Response inhibition, working memory, emotional control, flexibility, sustained attention, and task initiation. Um, very often parents or teachers will say to me, I got a kid with all kinds of executive skill challenges, where do I start? And my first answer is start with whatever is getting in the way the most. Um, but if that's not particularly helpful, because they'll say, yeah, I don't even know where to start, he's got so many. Then I'll say start with one of the first six. Uh, because these lend themselves to easier executive skills and uh, easy, easier interventions, and because these are the foundation for the later executive skills. So the advanced executive skills are planning and prioritizing, organization, time management, goal-directed persistence, and metacognition. Um, and let me just say, all of these actually, to some extent or another, require metacognition. Um, with the possible exception of organization, I honestly don't know what to do with that skill. <laughs> Because I've found huge differences, actually from a fairly early age, in people's organizational skills. I think there are some people who are naturally organized, and there are some people who are naturally disorganized. Uh, and so, actually, let me see if this audience is like my typical audience. How many of you in here think, think of yourselves as being pretty organized? Yeah, you should get between a third and a half. I think I have more than a th more than half here. That's really good. Um, how? Let me let me throw this out. How far back do you remember being that way? The, high school. Interesting. The usual answer I get is forever. 
when someone says high school, and I've had people say graduate school and people say college, some said middle school, my thinking there is that there was something about the demands placed at that particular point in your life where you had, your, you had to up your game. Uh, and you had, to, you had to figure out, okay, I'm not very organized, I gotta get this, I gotta figure this out. Um, but I, I see people who are naturally organized who maintain it goes back you know, as far as they can remember. I remember doing a workshop in uh, Littleton, Massachusetts a few years ago, and they asked me to talk to 10th graders. So I, I have a different PowerPoint I use for them, but I did the same thing with them. How many in here think of themselves as being pretty organized? About a third of the class raised their hand. I said, how far back do you remember being that way? And I, I remember a girl sitting in the front row said she could remember at the age of two lining up her shoes in her bedroom. And I thought, this is my weakest skill. And I thought, man, could you come to my bedroom and line up my shoes? They're still not lined up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I don't know what to do with organization. I think some people come by it naturally, and other people, if they're not naturally organized, at some point in their life they bump up against something that requires them to become more organized, and then they figure it out. I would say for me, that came in my late 50s, early 60s. <laughs> and here's, here's why it happened, because, and this is typical of the aging process, I've always thought of myself as having really good working memory, but you know, with age, working memory starts to decline. And I see organization and working memory going together. So as I watched my working memory decline, I thought, I gotta beef up my organization. You know, so I used to be able to come home from work and toss my car keys anywhere because I'd remember where they were. You know, and after a couple of times of searching for them frantically, because my working memory wasn't as good anymore, I realized, you know what, if you come home and you always hang your car keys on this one hook, They'll always be there the next day. <laughs> so th think of yourself. Uh, my guess is whichever of those skills you are strongest in, working memory or organization, you're using that skill to compensate for the weaker one. And if you see that start changing with age, then you better start beefing up uh, the weaker one and see if you can get better at it. Okay. So, so that's why I don't quite know what to do with organization. Uh, but all of the others... I, there's such a strong um, component of metacognition in there that, that it's really hard to talk about planning or time management or goal-directed persistence without also talking about metacognition. So that's why these are all sort of bundled together. Um, so let me, let me, I won't spend a lot of time on strategies to build the foundational executive skills. Again, if this is something you're interested in, you may want to look at uh, the Smart But Scattered book that we wrote for kid, aimed at parents of kids between the ages of four and 14. Um, or Smart But Scattered Teens, which is aimed at um, parents of teenagers, and obviously there's some overlap between the two. We tend to define which book you should buy, <laughs> or how to think about your kid is, when is your kid pushing back? <laughs> when is he telling you, you're not going to teach me anything anymore, I don't want to listen to you? that's when you should get Smart But Scattered Teens because that's the book that's, that talks about the parent-teen relationship and how you, what, what tools you do have available since you can no longer teach your kid. Um, okay, so very quickly, you know, for response inhibition, we teach wait and stop. Sounds a little simplistic, um, but if you can get that into kids. And by the way, if you go to, to YouTube and type in Sesame Street Executive Functions, they have a whole set of skits on teaching little kids to wait and stop, um, all featuring Cookie Monster, <laughs> and getting him to wait before he eats the cookie. Um, although the skits, the vignettes were designed for, obviously, preschoolers, uh, if you present them right, you can, you can watch them with, with teenagers. Um, so that's, that's the approach we take with response inhibition. Uh, for working memory, um, we, t we teach offloading and workarounds. Uh, and I mean, in part because I'm not convinced that you can dramatically strengthen working memory, um, especially with kids with significant learning disabilities, which teachers who work with that population tell me this is the weakest skill. Uh, and so rather than trying to spend a lot of time strengthening your kids' working memory, um, teaching, them how, how to, teaching them strategies for cueing themselves or teaching them strategies for remembering um, or teaching them how to use technology 
to, to build in those strategies. The idea of offloading <laughs> is, this is an important concept, you may be able to, again, those of you who are teenagers, what, with teenagers, they think their working memory is way better than it is. Right, that's why they say, I don't need to write down my homework, I'll remember. Right? Yeah, I know, I finished my homework, it's on my desk, I'm not gonna put it in my backpack, I'll remember to do that before I leave for school tomorrow. Uh, there's, a, there's a technical term for that. It's called positive illusory bias. <laughs> what that means is these kids, and it's true of all kids, but it's particularly true of ADHD kids, um, they have this assumption that they're, they function way better than they do. Um, it's a bias, and it's an illusion. <laughs> so we, we present that first, and then we say, okay, now you need to understand offloading. Because if you can offload... That means you don't have to use your brain anymore to remember. If you can put a reminder in your smartphone that reminds you to put all your work in your backpack uh, as soon as at the end, before you go to bed, then your brain doesn't have to remember that tomorrow. You put it right in your smartphone. Um, so that offloading can sometimes again, teenagers are, they want to do the quickest, easiest. Uh, solution to anything. So if you tell them that offloading is an easier, quicker, more reliable solution than trying to hold it all in their head, maybe they'll be willing to write, jot down that note to themselves or put a big post-it on their bedroom door that reminds them of something they need to do before they leave in the morning. I mean, there are all sorts of strategies. Um, emotional control. Um, this is not an easy one, and so all I can do is mention a couple of s strategies quickly. Teaching kids to talk to themselves. What could you say to yourself to manage that anger, that irritation, that emotion? Um, or not just negative emotions, but teaching them self-talk to access positive emotions. What could you say to yourself to? <laughs> I'll give you an example that I applied to myself about two, about two years ago. As I was driving to work every day, listening to National Public Radio and getting angrier and angrier, and it's certainly no better now, um, listening to the news. And I would just get so mad. I, you know, one of my strategies actually is to listen to classical music on my way to work. So there's a strategy right there for, to avoid all the negative stuff you're hearing. But I, the self-talk strategy I began to use was whenever I heard a story that just made me angry, I, I said aloud as I'm driving my car by myself, this is interesting. <laughs> Try it. The next time you hear a, really, a story that makes you really, really angry, just say to yourself, this is interesting. It's hard to be both angry and interested at the same time. <laughs> so that's, a, that's an example of teaching kids self-talk. It works best when you get kids to use their own self-talk. I, I may have told this story last year. My son, at one point, when he came back from college, and, and I was surprised he'd done as well as he had because he was meeting deadlines and handing stuff in on time, and I said to him, Aaron, that was hard for you in high school. I, I forgot to mention, I had a son with an attention disorder. So, um, so I said, You're, you always had trouble like, meeting deadlines. You know, what changed? And, and what he said was, he said, Mom, when I'm writing a term paper and I just want to quit, I tell myself, you can't walk away from this. So there's an example of using self-talk to access persistence. You can't walk away from this. Um, and then mindfulness meditation, which has gotten, I mean, there's a lot of tools and, and resources out there. Schools are doing it a lot now. There's a program developed by Goldie Hahn called the Mind Up Curriculum that she tested first in the Vancouver Public Schools to make sure it worked. Um, there, are, there are books for parents. Um, there's a great book called Sitting Still Like a Frog, uh, which comes with a DVD, which just has quick uh, sort of guided meditation using kid language and kid metaphors um, that you could do just before bed. Um, both of these, though, require practice. If you have a child with significant problems with emotional control, um, don't expect the problem to go away quickly. It just takes time. Um, with flexibility, uh, a lot of what we focus on there is the language, helping, using language to help kids become more flexible. So we say to them, looks like you're stuck. What could you do to get unstuck? Or is that a big deal or a little deal? Uh, or, okay, that's plan A, but what, the, what if that doesn't work? Do you have plan B? Uh, and then again, as parents, modeling flexibility. So if you hit a situation where you know, something didn't work out the way you wanted it to, and you find yourself getting inflexible, even if you don't, if you have an inflexible kid, just 
talking aloud about how this wasn't what you'd hoped it was going to be, and you're, now you're disappointed, and now you're going to have to figure out a way to, to resolve the situation. And they, the kids will hear your thought process, and that will lead them eventually to developing a more flexible thought process of their own. Uh, sustained attention. Um, there, I mean, <laughs> there's no way around it. You've got to gradually increase the kid's attention span. You've got to start from where they're at. Uh, I remember a few years ago having a, a, a mom, um, well, both parents um, of a seven-year-old in my office telling me about how their kid had some significant attention problems. Uh, I worked with the kid. He did have some significant attention problems. Um, and when I met with the mom afterwards, because the dad had to go to work, um, <laughs> and I was explaining, you know, he's got a very short attention span. You can't expect to give him a 30-minute task and expect him to carry it out because I think his attention span is about five minutes. Uh, and the mom said, is there any way you could put that in the report so that my husband would read that? <laughs> Her husband, his fun thing to do on Saturday was with his seven-year-old son, go, go out for a three-hour bike ride. And he got, he'd come home and he got really, he'd say to his wife, after 30 minutes he wanted to turn around. <laughs> well, with a kid for an attention span of five minutes, I would say, man, he got through 30 minutes? <laughs> so I did figure out some way of saying it. I mean, you got to start from where the kid is at. And part of my approach is to uh, increase kids' own self-awareness rather than just saying, Okay, we're gonna, when you're doing your homework, we'll take a break every five minutes. You can get up and jump around for two minutes, and then we'll go back and do the homework. You, and you, you, that's where you may want to start, but eventually you may want to say to the kid, how long can you go before you take a break? Um, and by the way, that whole technology and homework at the same time thing, you know, and you may have teenagers telling you because they've learned a few sort of brain words, and they said, oh, I can multitask. The brain does not multitask, <laughs> and you might tell them that. Uh, the brain cannot do two effortful things at the same time. It can't do two tasks that require executive skills at the same time. So what is the brain doing when the kid thinks he's multitasking? Jumping back and forth, back and forth. Very inefficient way to work, and on top of that, you're training the brain to work inefficiently. So far better to say to a kid, how long can you work before you need to check your phone or before you need to go on Instagram or Facebook or whatever you're doing? and let's make a deal. Let's set a timer, whatever. And it may be, I, I just was in a, did a workshop earlier this week where um, a, a teacher said that she was working with one individual kid around that whole issue, and it was, she wasn't doing any homework, and she said, how long can you go? Five minutes. So okay, five minutes. Every five minutes, take a two-minute break. You know, within six weeks, she was up to 15 minutes. So that's what I mean about gradually increasing it. And, and she was giving the girl control, so the girl was decide, deciding how to expand that. Um, and then finally, task initiation. Um, and that is teach kids to make a plan with a start time. And then make sure they start the plan at the time they said they were going to start. <laughs> that's the really critical piece. Uh, and as I, I may have gone into more detail about this last year, but my rationale behind that is, again, it goes back to the brain. The brain learns by association. So if you can strengthen the link between the stated start time and the actual start time over and over and over again, then stated start time is going to trigger actual start time. So if your kid gets up on Saturday morning and you say to him, what's your plan for cleaning your bed, and the kid says, or cleaning your bedroom, the kid says, I'll do it right after lunch, then your job as a parent is to be there right after lunch and make sure they're starting to clean their bedroom. And if the kid protests, you say, here's why we're doing it, because the brain learns by association. And give them, kids love the brain explanation, by the way. <laughs> Anything. I have a friend who teaches, um, she has a whole set of uh, lessons that she teaches to third graders. She's a school psychologist. She calls it train your brain. Um, and first she, she did it primarily to teach executive skills, but then she realized kids just love what's going on in the brain, and so she starts by giving them probably a 10-week introduction to how the brain works. And she has kids who pass her in the hall and say, hey, Mrs. Sperry, my amygdala is working great today. <laughs> That's the fight or flight part of the brain. And then they go home and tell their parents, my amygdala was doing really well in school today. And the parents are looking at them like, what are you talking about? Kids love it. So um, think of that as well. OK. So now helping kids grow their own executive skills. 
So in the beginning, I mean, the progression is we act as surrogate frontal lobes for our kids, right? We lend them our frontal lobes. Um, and so we do the planning for them. We do the time management. You know, I often joke that, you know, there's no parent out there would say to their seven-year-old, you can go to bed whenever you want, just make sure you get enough sleep. Or you can get up whenever you want, just make sure you're ready for school on time. I mean, that's time management, right? So we do that for them. And if it turns out they're doddlers and it takes them longer to get ready for school, then we readjust. We put them to bed early or we wake them up earlier. Uh, so we do that for them. But eventually, kids have to learn to manage their own time. Um, and so we have to ha hand off that process of us managing our kids to them managing themselves. And I'm just going to give you a few uh, tips on that, and then we'll probably be done. Um, first of all, ask kids to reflect on their own performance, especially when they're successful. You know, we tend to focus on when things go wrong. We say, gee, what went wrong? What do you think you could do differently? Why did it go wrong? What do you think you could do differently the next time? And then we totally forget to process with kids things that went well and talking with them about why it went well, because they may not even be aware of what they did differently this time f for that to be successful. Um, we, we have a general rule of thumb when we talk about um, giving kids positive reinforcement. Um, we basically say, if you can achieve a ratio of three positives for every corrective feedback, that alone can change behavior. It's very hard to achieve. But I'll throw it out there because we have a ton of research to show that it's very effective. But I've started applying that same rule to this. If you're going to have a kid debrief when something goes wrong, you better find three other things out there to debrief with them about when, when it went right. Wow, it took you less time to get ready for school this morning. What was different? Oh, the TV was off. Hmm, that's interesting. So you didn't get distracted by watching television. So how can we use this information tomorrow? Um, what worked for you today? Why do you think it worked? Uh, use questions to get them to use their executive skills. What's your plan? Do you have a strategy for that? What's your goal? How long do you think that will take? I mean, just peppering uh, kids with those, or, or, or just mixing those kinds of questions into conversations. My, I have three grandchildren, and my, um, my oldest granddaughter is five, and I could see probably starting around 18 months that she was a little inflexible. <laughs> so when things didn't go the way she wanted or she expected it to go, then she, we would have meltdowns or tantrums. Um, and her mom was wonderful at handling her. And I noticed, probably starting around age two, she would say to Violet, okay, Violet, let's make a plan. So when she got upset about something, Violet, I know you're disappointed because we can't do that right now, but let's make a plan. <laughs> and so that just became part of the conversation. Um, and I know there will be a payoff for that. If not, if it isn't already there, um, that that will pay off. Um, so, in all of those, do you have a strategy for that? You know, when, I mean, if a kid suggests something outrageous they want to do that you know you're probably going to have to say no to anyway, before you jump in and say no, just say, okay, tell me your strategy for that. <laughs> they may be able to persuade you, who knows, if they have some really good thoughts about how that's going to go. <laughs> I mean, then you can say, if you realize that there are some holes in their strategy, you can say, and if that happens, then what are you going to do? <laughs> um, okay. When problems arise, share your observations in a non-judgmental way. I noticed you describe the behavior. I noticed you got really upset when you realized it took you longer to finish your homework and you weren't going to be able to play video games. So what do you think we can do about that? Um, keeping, and you know, my kids are now in their late 30s, so it feels like totally uh, presumptuous of me to say to parents, okay, keep your emotions out of it, right? because <laughs> I certainly couldn't when my kids were teenagers in particular. In fact, I remember my son at one point when, I, when he was in college, um, and we would periodically reflect back on his childhood, and he'd tell me everything I did wrong. Uh, <laughs> eventually, he started telling me what I did right, but this was one of those everything I did wrong conversations where he said, Mom, there were times in high school where I didn't even think you liked me. And this is me as an expert on ADHD. You know, who knew that was probably what was getting in the way with my kid, and yet I couldn't keep that anger and that irritation out of my voice, and my son picked up on it. So uh, just uh, tuck that in the back of your head, because here's what we, again, goes back to the brain. When, when kids hit adolescence, we talk about hot cognitions and cool cognitions. Um, 
and things like emotional control and response inhibition or hot cognitions, if a parent raises their emotional level, you're triggering something in your kid's brain that just can't resist, they're gonna raise their emotional level. If you can keep your emotions out of it, then it makes it more, your kids may still get upset, but at least it doesn't end up being a, a, an escalation on both of your parts. Um, brainstorm strategies. Together with the child, make a list of possible strategies. Ask the child to pick one. Check back with the child later to see how it worked. And even if that first strategy they're picking you don't think is going to work, let them try it out. It's an experiment. We're now applying the scientific method. Um, and if you can figure out some way to document whether it worked or not so that you and the kid will agree, on whether it worked or not. One of my favorite examples of that is um, parents are often annoyed because their kids um, want to listen to music while they're doing their homework. Now, I talked about how multitasking doesn't work. Music is a whole different ballgame. Music can actually act as background noise to make it easier for kids to work, and I'm sure many of you have kids who have told you that, and you didn't believe them. <laughs> um, so here's the experiment. Have them do their math homework every day for five days listening to music, see how long it takes them to do the homework and how many mistakes they made. The next week, have them do their math homework without listening to music, see how long it took them to do it and how many mistakes they made. There you have a natural experiment that may tell you. Don't do it for just one day each because kids can sort of pull it, hold it together for one day, but over five days each with each um, condition, my guess is you'll be able to know. Now, I will say, and this is worth talking with your kids about, my son said he could never listen to music with lyrics because he started paying attention to the words. He could only listen to instrumental music. So you may want to put in some ground rules about what music kids are listening to, but, I mean, there's an example of, of how to make that a, a, an experiment. Um, and then, finally... Keep your eye on the biggest prize, building goal-directed persistence. First of all, you know, in the thick of it, you know, when my kids were in their first two decades of life, I had no idea whether the behavior my husband and I were modeling to our kids was having any impact on them at all. Um, especially around, you know, age 12, 13, 14, where these kids don't want to do anything that requires work. They only want to do fun stuff. Um, and they, they're living for the moment. Um, and so were they actually watching or picking up anything from the way my husband and I lived our lives? They absolutely were. But it, it was trumped by being an early adolescent. But it came out eventually. And I, for some reason, I had this sense of that. And, you know, I wasn't always brilliant in terms of figuring out what was going on with my kids or what the development was going to be like. But I remember I, around that age with both of my kids saying, I'm not going to worry about goal-directed persistence. When these kids find their passion, it will be there. Because they had two very hardworking parents, two parents who, who put, you know, 150% into their, into their jobs you know, while also being parents, but they could see we were both working hard and we valued hard work and we valued achieving goals. Um, with my two kids, it was different. My younger son was probably somewhere during high school that he figured out what his passion was. Um, unfortunately, it didn't match what the school wanted of him to do, but... <laughs> my older son, it probably took him to age 25. That was my ADD kid. You know, he graduated from college on time, but then he delivered pizza and saved up money to move to Costa Rica because he thought learning Spanish in a pretty country might be fun. <laughs> Lived in a subsistence manner in Costa Rica for nine months, came home, delivered more pizza. Um, and then he found the job that he wanted. And he threw himself 100% into applying for that job and getting it. And ever since then, it's been there. So those, as long as you have good goal-directed persistence, your kids will pick up on that. So don't worry about now because it'll come out when they're ready to apply it. And then I want to uh, end with a, a quote. Um, I've been doing some work with the Fairfield, Connecticut uh, School District and, uh, a, and a principal of a, uh, the alternative high school there uh, was talking to me last summer about the whole idea of restorative practice and restorative justice. Uh, and she said, there's this great group called the International Institute for Restorative Practices. Um, you may want to check out what they're doing, because we found in our school setting, when we bring this into the classroom to resolve conflicts um, or disagreements, it's working really well. So I went back and I looked at their stuff, and I found this quote, um, which to me just captures um, my philosophy about how we work with kids. Uh, and the quote is this. 
Human beings are happier and more cooperative and productive and more likely to make positive changes in their behavior when those in positions of authority do things with them rather than to them or for them. That really sort of captures it all because doing things to them or for them is where we make mistakes all the time and I, I've made mistakes too. Um, so I will leave you with that. Um, I think we've I've ended a couple minutes early, so to give you a little extra time to get to your next session, and I'd be happy to mingle with people outside and answer questions. But thank you very much for coming, and I hope this made sense to you.